Okay, for a summary, uh, I think this introduction slide would be best for me, and then I'll turn over to Don to talk about his. But we did talk about the problem, uh, which would be contaminant transport from the Red Hill Fuel Storage Facility to uh, public drinking water sources, and the problems of actually defining how groundwater flows. So we described the setting, of course, Red Hill is within the Red Hill Ridge, and we have uh, principal drinking water sources to the northwest and to the southeast. And we have two actually somewhat competing uh, conceptual models of the way groundwater flows. One would be from Mount Bosch or Mount Mackay. The other would be from Honolulu to Pearl Harbor. And structures that will influence the groundwater flow are one of the things that we have been looking at and still currently do not fully understand at this time. And that would be uh, the valley fills and the underlying saprolite, the uh, late stage volcanics and the erupt events to the uh, southwest of the facility. And also look at the groundwater elevations and what it shows and actually what it doesn't show. and the problems with actually using groundwater elevation to uh, ascertain groundwater flow direction and then using groundwater chemistry as an alternative approach, primarily to primary traces, which would be chloride, a natural occurring tracer, and nitrate, which is naturally occurring and which is also uh, anthropogenic uh, in nature. And so I'll let, I'll stop sharing and let Don go uh, talk about what he has for his part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, am I unmuted now? Uh, <laughs> what, what I talked about in my presentation was some of the challenges that we face in actually understanding how a contaminant such as El Napel or groundwater moves through this region. Uh, it is extraordinarily complex geologically. And so the work that we've proposed is to try to better understand how the fuel would be transported from the tanks to the groundwater table. And then once at the groundwater table, how that fuel would interact with the water and dissolve contaminants. And then how that those contaminants in the water would migrate below the tanks and out and whether in fact it would migrate and at what rate it would migrate towards these potential drinking water wells. So in order to do that, we're talking about better defining the major structural features out there, uh, which includes the ridge, the regional ridge, the, uh, the valley fill material, which responds very differently to, from water transport than the uh, basaltic rocks. We also want to characterize how water and fuel move through the rocks. We want to understand how various stresses on the groundwater system are conveyed throughout the aquifer. And by stresses, I mean when pumping is occurring or when pumping is not occurring, the water motion may change and develop as detailed a, a uh, geologic model for this region as we can and use that as the foundation of a numerical model that will allow us then to make computations and, and understand the rate and direction of flow and from that the degree of risk that a release of any given volume would pose to any of the surrounding groundwater wells. So that was the primary focus of my presentation. And with that, I will stop sharing and, and be ready to answer questions. Um, this is Linda Green. I have been unmuted. The reason that we are um, looking at this geological feature of the mountain that has this water source in it is because there are fuel tanks that are sitting above the water source. Um, I'm feeling like the tanks will eventually be emptied. And um, I'm wondering if the process of emptying the tanks is going to be another source of contamination 
when they do it. Thank you. Well, uh, this is Bob, and I guess my response would be that the fuel is moved in and out of the tanks on a routine basis. So at least for the Red Hill Ridge, I would personally not see an increased risk due to that operation. And once the operation is complete, then the risk to the groundwater decreases significantly. Linda, if you had a follow-up, um, you could add it to the chat. Otherwise, I'll call on, uh, I think Cliff Foss was next. So I'll give you permission to unmute. Okay, no video? Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Don and Bob, I really liked your talk and I really like the work that you've been doing and that you propose. Particularly, uh, I like the El Napple basalt interaction study that you're planning on doing to see uh, how long that source, if it's hanging under Red Hill, how long it's going to last and how it might leach out into the groundwater uh, over what sort of time period. Uh, your work and thinking about Red Hill has uh, really got me thinking of a lot of interesting things for me. And I wanted to mention two of them here. Um, one is that, well, groundwater flow is three dimensional. So even if you have a valley fill uh, between, say, Pearl Harbor and uh, Red Hill, uh, groundwater might. Uh, try to sneak under the valley fill. Groundwater can go up and down and not just laterally. And so even if you better define the valley fills, there's still a question of where does the groundwater like the flow? How is it going to try to get to where it's going? It might flow down valley towards, straight towards the ocean, or it might go laterally. Uh, the two flow systems that you've been talking about, trying to find out which it is, they may be mixed together. So some of the superficial groundwater that comes from under Red Hill that may have dissolved El Napple uh, products, uh, that may actually flip underneath uh, the valley to, uh, to the Northwest. It's possible, I don't know. That's something interesting to think about uh, and how the, the vertical permeability of the basalt is really high. Uh, even though it's lower than the horizontal, it's really high compared to most other aquifers in the world. Uh, yeah, the vertical flow in the basalt happens really easily. So uh, the groundwater can easily dip underneath the structure uh, and like that, like the geologic structure. So that's something to think about in, in the future as well. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about was the timing of the groundwater flow. So uh, the water in Oahu flows really quickly in the groundwater. It might be moving one meter a day, three meters a day laterally. That's pretty darn fast. It's almost like a slow river. Uh, that's from work that we've done years ago. We uh, found that water may be moving that fast. So it's about four or five kilometers to Pearl Harbor. And that means that uh, if the water is flowing one to three meters a day, that from under Red Hill, the water uh, that is under Red Hill would arrive at Pearl Harbor in five to 15 years after it gets there. So if there's a contaminant uh, from previous spills, under Red Hill, that's already arrived at Pearl Harbor or probably wherever it's going. And I'm wondering if there, hasn't there been any measurements in wells in any direction where the water may be going that show any uh, parts of El Napple breakdown products that are dissolved in the water? So uh, yeah, so this water that's under Red Hill now from the recent spill, five to 15 years, if it's going to Pearl Harbor and they discharge under Pearl Harbor or wherever it's going. So that's that's kind of things I've been thinking. It was really interesting what you talked about and what you're working on. So thanks for that and uh, happy to talk more about it in the future. Okay. Bob, do you wanna yeah. sort of comment on the contaminants from yeah. prior releases? Okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks Cliff. And the first uh, point that you brought up and that was flow under the valley fill and Yes, definitely. We view that as a possibility. The, what I consider the primary contaminant, though, would be the El Napple. And I would see the Valley Fill saprolite sequence as blocking the El Napple. So to get that from 
uh, Red Hill to the Halava side, you would have to go around the Valley Fill, which the upper Tula Valley Fill, which certainly there are indications that might be possible. The dissolved phase, the aquifer has a rather robust capacity to break down the dissolved contaminants. So that's why, at least for my position, I look at it as a secondary risk in that if you can block the Elnapple, then at some point, and some work I did some years ago estimated a thousand feet in front of the Elnapple plume, you would be in environmental compliance for the dissolved contaminants. And as far as monitoring, most of the actively monitored wells are beneath the tanks and along the northwest side of the facility. We do have, well, we, the Navy does have currently a well and installing others to the southwest. The one that has been there for quite some time occasionally gets low levels of uh, TPH type contamination. Uh, but it does seem to be in a confined uh, setting in that when they drilled that well, they actually had to drill below sea level to actually get to the basal aquifer once they penetrated a dense uh, lava flow, then the water level come up to about the expected elevation of uh, 18 to 19 feet above sea level. There is no other active investigation I know of between that lower monitoring well and the uh, Pearl Harbor shoreline. But there have been releases at Pearl Harbor proper. And so it would be difficult to pick out anything from Red Hill from what is already in the coastal groundwater uh, by the refueling pier, which uh, we refer to as the Halava Pier or where there was a large release above the submarine base from an above ground storage tank. Uh, that was kind of my take on your questions. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll jump in and add just a little bit. Um, and one of the, as Bob said, I mean, we certainly recognize the, the possibility of the dissolved contaminants uh, in effect diving below the, the uh, uh, alluvium Saprolite wedges, and really our, our prime objective is to develop a model that will actively be able to characterize the relative movement given the fact that the horizontal uh, hydraulic conductivity is different from the vertical hydraulic conductivity. And that model will give us, I'm hoping, some sense of, of what the likelihood would be of that kind of process occurring. And as Bob says, uh, you know, the, the um, natural degradation processes are relatively fast here. So it's really a question of, is this process fast enough to be able to transport these contaminants under, uh, under these barriers or around the barriers that there will be a risk or not a risk. And that, that's all gonna be part of the, the risk assessment that, that is our ultimate goal there. And in terms of releasing these uh, contaminants into Pearl Harbor, that was one of the things that we wanted to, to attempt. Um, and that is to try to do uh, this controlled source uh, resistivity survey within the uh, Harbor region to see if we can find evidence, number one, of freshwater uh, below uh, the uh, floor of the harbor that would indicate that we do have uh, freshwater from onshore migrating uh, below and, and within the cap rock, and then look for areas in which that, that water may be discharging into Pearl Harbor. And so, you know, if we can, if we're successful at that, and again, this is kind of a, a, a fairly new technique. Uh, it's been demonstrated over on the west side of the Big Island. Uh, you know, we don't really know all of the, the challenges we may have there, but the intent is to try to 
document uh, evidence of uh, spring freshwater spring discharge into, into Pearl Harbor from below. Okay, up next is going to be Christina and then Barbara had a question in the chat after that. Okay. Thank you guys for being available. I appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering if you could identify which individuals and organizations are actively investigating these questions of which direction water and contaminants are flowing? Who's involved in all this? Well, currently, of course, the Navy is involved and their contractors. Uh, and of course, the Department of Health is involved uh, and the University of Hawaii. USGS is involved principally in long-term monitoring of groundwater elevations and also the Water Commission is working with all of the aforementioned groups. Did you say USGS, Geological Survey? Yes. Thank you very much. Yep. OK, next is Barbara. Um, Aurora, were you going to do that? Sure. OK, so Barbara Beacons um, asked, Don, could you elaborate on the GPR work you're proposing to do and what you hope it will show? OK, um, let's see. the the. Okay, we didn't actually propose to do a GPR for those that are not familiar with the te technologies is, is ground penetrating radar. At least that's what I'm interpreting the question to, to be addressing. And we aren't actually proposing to do uh, ground penetrating radar work as such. The, in my opinion, the ground penetrating radar would have too shallow a depth of penetration to be much value to, you, to us. But the hope is what we do plan to do is uh, electrical resistivity tomography, which uh, I understand can penetrate significantly deeper. And also we will supplement that with um, uh, audio uh, magnetotellurics. In particular, what we're looking for there is to, to try to better define the I'll say the, the hydraulic conductivity within the stratigraphic sequence. We know that we have uh, varying compositions of lavas below the surface. Uh, we have seen in some of the wells that have been drilled, the monitoring wells that have been drilled, that we have saturated zones that are well above, even in the basalt, well above the basal water table. Uh, we also uh, have evidence that some of the clinkers, uh, uh, clinker zones have sufficient clay in them that they are actually serving as uh, not so much perching formations, but formations across which water is flowing. And so our attempt is to, to try to characterize those to as great a depth as we can get to and incorporate those zones into our understanding of, of how, number one, the fuel is going to move if there are, are perching zones in there that's going to uh, divert the fuel laterally. We'd like to know about that because in order to model the transport of the, uh, I'm sure you will know this, the, as, if you're going to model the transport of the contaminants, we need to know where the, the LNAP, will, the fuel is in contact with the water. And so if we are getting significant lateral movement, we need to know that. But those are the, the primary things we're, we're really going to try to use these techniques to, to better understand sort of the intermediate scale structures uh, within the ridges and apply that to understanding how the both the LNAP and groundwater is going to move through the system. So that's that's really what we're going to be trying to do. Okay, thanks. Um, next up is Steve Turnbull. So Steve, I'll give you permission to unmute. Uh, while Steve is unmuting, uh, I'd like to explain what LNAPL is. LNAPL is light non-aqueous phase liquid, and that is that jet fuel, which was the contaminant, is does not dissolve in water. So it is a forms a layer on top of the water, which makes it light and uh, 
It doesn't dissolve readily, so it's non-aqueous phase liquid. And that would uh, could move under its own hydraulic uh, gradients if there is enough, or move with the groundwater flow if there is a small layer of apple. So wanted to clear that up. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, this is Steve Turnbull from the Army Corps of Engineers. Bob and Donna, I thought it was a great presentation. There's a tremendous amount of information that you, in an hour, summarized um, as, as I think as best as it could possibly be done. I did have actually two questions. My first question was, um, in following all the, 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 the remediation on the wells that are going to be drilled as part of the last two fuel spills and the spills, fuel spills in the past, I noticed that you know a great many of the wells are very very close to the facility itself, and and just it seems like there's more uncertainty in the groundwater flow further away from the site towards Mauna Loa Valley inland. Um, might it be better for? It seems like a lot of the wells are going in areas where we kind of know what's going to happen to the groundwater flow, and might it be better to put some of the wells further away to get more of that regional groundwater flow? Because I agree, it is very uncertain. And might that be helpful? Well, of course, all of the wells that have been put in have been put on Navy property, except for a few that are on the <clears throat> uh, state side, on the prison side. But for groundwater flow purposes, actually are monitoring quite regionally, and that would be in the USGS Navy program of the long-term monitoring of groundwater elevations. And that those wells go from Mauna Lua well, from the southeast side of Monlua Valley over into uh, well beyond Halaba into uh, Cotamilo deep monitoring well. So for groundwater flow, we do have a very, there is a very extensive network that is plans in the work to increase the well coverage to the non on site areas, principally looking to the northwest and the difficulty is getting uh, permission from the landowners to put in a well, to, since it may impact operations of the lessees or the landowners, or people just not wanting something like that on their property. Uh, but yes, your point is well taken and uh, believe it is being worked on. Okay, terrific. And then um, as part of the, um the uh, chloride mass balance and the, the nitrate mass balances. Did you look at any of the stabilized soaps like chlorine 36 and nitrogen 1415, if that would help you at all? Or, and then also I was wondering finally, what in your dye tracer study, what tracer you were planning to use? Okay. We haven't done any chlor uh, chloride isotopes, but I do. And other work I've been doing have been collecting nitrate isotopes. And as that last slide that I presented in my part stated that that is being looked at and uh, incorporating that since the nitrate was somewhat ambiguous in that we had within Red Hill zones of nitrate depletion, which could be because there just was no nitrate there or because it got consumed by natural attenuation. If it is being consumed by natural attenuation, then we should see an increase in the heavy nitrogen 15 isotope or increase in delta N15 number. And although the tracer test is still in the planning phase, from my personal experience, I would use fluorescein because as Lahaina has shown, it will be stable in the uh, environment, even a degraded environment for a period of years. So. It's not going to degrade and you're going to miss it. Of course, other popular dyes would be rhodamine WT, but I don't have an experience with that one. So. Thanks. Yep. Okay, uh, up next in the queue is Shiv and then Ali in the chat, Charlie, Eric in the chat and Michael in the chat. Um, so Shiv, I'll give you permission to unmute and please remain unmuted until you're done uh, asking your question. John, I think uh, as Robert pointed out that uh, this uh, um, jet fuel 
it floats on the water surface and is there any way to monitor it regularly on the because we are really concerned about the mixing of this thing with the water and it's very extremely soluble so it takes long time for it to dissolve so is there any active program to monitor the um, jet fuel or the hydrocarbons on the surface of the water so, Don, I think I'll let you take that one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, there, there's actually, I mean, there, there is an active program um, that has been sampling the wells under the, the tanks. And as part of that regular monitoring program, and it's been going on for a number of years, it's more intensively now than, than in the past, but uh, water samples are collected and the Department of Health has specified that that the samples be collected in a way that will capture any uh, liquid fuel sitting on the water table. Uh, they also have uh, a device that they are supposed to be using during their sampling program that will detect a uh, second layer if it's of, of more than, than you know, very, very uh, small thickness of fuel that's sitting on the water table. So that is being done. And it, uh, the, sort of that's the good news. The bad news is it's not being done on a continuous basis. And that's something that um, I'm hoping that you know, we'll be able to investigate the feasibility of doing something like that. Um, and I don't have any answers at this point of, oh, well, all I gotta do is buy this instrument, put it in the well and we'll be, we'll be good. Um, I think there actually is some technology development possibilities to be able to specifically look for, say, fluorescence in the fuel products, as well as in the uh, degradation products. And so far, uh, so far as I've gone, and there's, there's a lot more work I have to do in, in, in standing up the, the research program to see what instrumentation is available already and what that can do, and then whether there is a need for something better than that in order to give us a, a more real-time ability to monitor these fuels. Because again, we don't really know uh, on a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis, you know, when this stuff showed up and when it went away, other than within that time period of sampling. And so having something that would allow us to continuously monitor and be able to track a either a dissolved uh, uh, contaminant plume or a very thin layer of, of Elm apple, I think would be very valuable. Thank you. I think our experiment in the lab has shown that there's a change in the amount of water or contaminants from the jet fuel uh, over a week's time. And uh, um, so uh, the way to continuous monitor, I think will be the way to do it. And there's a device uh, that uses a UV LED to find out um, the fluorescence, something. And some of these things can detect uh, one micron thick layer on the top of the water. So I think we should consider about that. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I definitely would like to, to see that explored. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Carrie, is the, I think the next question was from Ali El Qadi. Um, mm -hmm. And this is for Bob. In your analysis of water flow based on the USGS data, did you consider the depth of the observation wells or their construction? Do you think scientific, uh, do you think significant uncertainties may exist? Well, one of my uh, sayings for groundwater is if you're afraid of uncertainty, then you shouldn't be dealing with groundwater. So yes, certain significant uncertainties do exist. Most of the wells in the monitoring network are water table wells, but 
with the USGS long-term monitoring, it also includes uh, some deep monitoring wells where the solid casing extends significantly into the groundwater. And it does produce some anomalies, but at this point we have not, uh, we meaning the whole group, uh, USGS, UH, DOH, the Navy, has not really looked at how that would affect the implied groundwater flow paths. But the Navy has installed a series of wells called West Bay Wells. And they are actually a tube put in a well with packers so it isolates uh, different sections of the boreholes, which can be instrumented. And the Navy has recorded data from up to five different points in these wells simultaneously. Uh, that data is of great interest, but at this point, it's not been looked at in detail. But hopefully that would alleviate some of those uncertainties for such things such as flow underneath the uh, valley fill. So, thank you. Great, um, up next is Charlie. Uh, I will ask you to unmute. Oh, hello. Uh, I'm switching gears a little bit, and if this is inappropriate, let me know. But uh, you've mapped out a very comprehensive and uh, a very impressive list of studies that you would like to see done to, to find out all that we would like to know. Um, I have my doubts that it can all be funded, that it's all going to get funded. And I wondered if you have developed a, a set of strategic priorities that you think uh, are the, the key things to do. Or is it better just to pursue what you what you like? You could go either way. Well, I guess I'll take that. Uh, I think it's referring to, to my list of, of things that we want to do. And, and we do have a proposal in uh, that uh, has been reviewed technically uh, and approved. Um, we think we have enough funding to, to be able to do all of those. Uh, certainly, we, we budgeted uh, an attempt to do all of those. And, you know, I, 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 at the same time, I have to say that one could spend a career pursuing some of these, some of these questions. Um, I think probably um, the ones that I know we can do are to better integrate all of our existing data and new data into that three-dimensional model and exert a bit more effort at developing a realistic conceptual site model for this area. Um, in terms of, of characterizing the um, uh, valley fill sections. You know, we've, we've used uh, seismic methods successfully to do this before. So we, we have a fairly high degree of confidence that we'll be able to do that. Uh, the gravity has been done. Uh, that's one of the geophysical surveys that we proposed to do. And that has been fairly successful. So I don't, I don't have any serious doubts that we'll be able to do that. Um, some of the uh, magnetotelluric and audio magnetotelluric uh, surveys, I think it's, it's more, uh, it's not so much a matter of the money as it is a matter of, of um, what I'd, I'd refer to as cultural noise. Um, the magnetotelluric methods are they, they rely on very uh, faint um, electromagnetic signals. And frankly, this, this area could not be more noisy in terms of uh, you know, stray signals in this area. It's, it's intensively developed uh, both by the Navy and residential areas and all that. Uh, we also have a lot of what I refer to as hardware, uh, electrical conductors that are buried in the ground. So I don't know how they are going to impact uh, our analysis of the data. 
but um, you know, I certainly expect that we have the resources to do um, sort of everything as possible that we proposed, uh, given given the unknowns that we have in this area. Okay, so the next question, I believe, was from the chat. Um, Laura, did you have that one? Yeah. So um, for those maybe that are calling in, I just want to make sure I read it. Um, Eric Matias writes, hi, Don et al. Note, since hydrocarbon has higher electrical resistivity signature than freshwater, controlled source EM will probably be able to distinguish the two. Um, but there's some dialogue with, between Eric and um, Barbara. Beacons, who writes um, that Eric, fresh hydrocarbon has higher resistivity, but older spills that are biodegrading have lower resistivity because of the production of carbonic acid and organic acids. And she provides a reference to Atequana and Atequana 2010 um, in surveys and geophysics. Um, geophysical signatures of microbial activity at hydrocarbon contaminated sites. Um, and so Eric responds, thanks, Barbara. The logic still applies, but if biodegraded hydrocarbons have lower uh, E signature, two to three ohm meter difference than G to groundwater, then CSEM can still differentiate between the two. So we have, um, so I, I'm going to just add, if you yeah. folks wouldn't mind adding um, maybe some of the definitions <laughs> to these yeah. acronyms that would help us yeah. make sure that they get folded into the um, the sure. records for this meeting. Yeah. Um, I, oh. I just wanted to, oh. Um. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Eric, what Eric is referring to is controlled source electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, we pump current into the ground. Um, and you know, that certainly is, is another possibility. Um, I, you know, all of this stuff, um, you know, we have to do in a way that is not going to, uh, have some potential to cause issues sort of with everybody, all the other users in, in the area, uh, the Navy, the, the prison, the quarry, all these others. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the input and, and certainly welcome it. Um, you know, none of us that are, are working on this feel like we have all the answers. So, you know, additional you know, really good scientifically based suggestions. I, I certainly want to hear about them and, and they will be considered in the overall program. Um, but our, our, our objective is not so much to try to identify the location of uh, the fuel contaminated ground. Uh, that I think is probably going to be impossible uh, except in very special circumstances, because you know we've got these very large steel tanks that will really impose a significant distortion on whatever electric field we have there, and um, that that's why when I proposed the, the uh, electrical resistivity tomography that we do it upslope from the tanks rather than over the top of the tanks because uh, sorting out you know, the impact of, the, of those steel conductors there, uh, I, I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in being able to do that. But thank you, thank you for the input, I do appreciate it. Um, next comments, um, if there's no other comments from the speakers, the other comments from the chat were from uh, Phoenix um, Grange, DOH Red Hill technical team lead, in response to um, Shiv Sharma, I note that El Napple is still visible in the Red Hill water development tunnel from the spill, though the mass appears to be diminishing over time. Um, thanks for the suggestion, Shiv Sharma. Um, and Michael, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your last name, um, in the chat added, would you care to speculate on the recent reports that the hydrocarbon releases seem to be moving toward the West? This one's a little bit difficult because I don't know what data has been made public and what is still privileged, but from what I see, I am not at this point in time concerned about a movement to the West. 
but also since uh, Phoenix Grange is on the line and she is more in tune with what is what DOH is position is on that, uh, it might be good to unmute her and see if she has some thoughts on this question. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, um, uh, we have this is a subject we've been looking at really carefully, um, particularly during once the uh, the pumps were shut down in December, um, collecting regular water samples and mapping them to understand what's happening. And so, oops, it looks like I'm muted again. Nope, no, no, I we think there's. Oh. We can still hear. You. Okay, sorry, I just got a sign that said I was muted. I guess I wasn't. Anyway, so um, we did see after the November. Um, 20th release when the, there was no pumping either at our shaft or at the, excuse me, at the Navy shaft or at the Board of Water Supply shaft, that there were, um, uh, there was some movement towards outer wells within the Navy property. Um, and these were detections that would kind of come and go. There might be high PID reading, PPH, other things in the water, but they weren't evidence of a um, continuous plume, but more sort of, sort of like a, oil drops in your soapy kitchen sink, you know, where they kind of come and go. Um, since the beginning of February, um, we've looked at that data set and you compare the levels of um, both the presence of fuel, you know, indicators and the range and both have gone down significantly. So now that pumping is um, uh, back on again, we had it turned off for some time. Um, we are seeing it, uh, what appears at the moment, of course, we only have the wells that we have, but it appears to be um, lessening spread and perhaps contraction of the, of the Im impacts at this point. But that becomes our main indicator. We just continue to look at the environmental indicators in terms of both soil vapor and soil um, and uh, groundwater data. Thanks. I think the next question was um, Shiv once again. So I'll ask you to unmute again. Rob, you mentioned about the nitrite in the water. So do you know what concentrations are there? Well, they're variable uh, up to about one and a half milligrams per liter. Uh, but we'd expect somewhere something less than a half a milligram per liter uh, for uh, Malcolm and Mackay flow. Oh, dear. But again, compare when I look at nitrate, I compare it to the source areas. And uh, for Malcolm and Mackay flow, of course, the source area would be the prime recharge areas. The other potential source area would be more flow underneath urban Honolulu. So that is a perspective I'm looking at for nitrate, not necessarily nitrate as a contaminant. So I think uh, um, a while ago, the ONR uh, funded us for detecting the uh, nitrite in the seawater. And uh, so we could go down to uh, nanomolar concentration by using a technique called surface enhanced lemon scattering. And it works pretty well. So I I don't know if can if you are interested in monitoring that or changing in it or not really. I guess that would be for Don to consider as okay. um, part okay. of his. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we do intend to sort of expand the effort that that Bob has has been really the, the lead on up to the present in terms of looking at natural uh, tracers, what, what we're characterizing as natural tracers. And um, you know, we, we are gonna be looking at all of these to see if they allow us and, and to what uh, degree of certainty they allow us to define the direction of flow. Uh, as Bob mentioned, you know, we, we, we would expect to see a certain uh, nitrate concentration for water uh, moving from the very pristine areas. And they, 
I should mention too that they would be isotopically uh, distinct from uh, the nitrate that would be present in waters that have passed below urbanized lands. And so, you know, in, in that context, I think, you know, our, our primary interest is being able to distinguish, say, sort of nitrate from pristine environments versus nitrate in uh, coming from urbanized environments. And the, in that case, the, the concentration is, is not, you know, mon and monitoring that concentration is not that informative unless the concentrations were to get much higher than than we've seen up to now. Yeah, so we talk about N15 isotope. Yeah. And so uh, what is the ratio of N15 as compared to the regular? Bob, that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for upslope recharge, expect a delta N15 of about three or less. Underneath more urbanized Honolulu, it varies from about oh, four to seven. Uh, in Red Hill, and I have to do this from memory, uh, they are elevated. The lowest one is about four parts per mil, uh, but it does go up, I think, to like 10 or 12, but that is in areas where we know we have natural attenuation of hydrocarbons. So we have low nitrate concentration, but elevated delta N15, which would be expected. The wells that we're most interested in are the ones that do not appear to be impacted by natural attenuation of fuels. And they would be more diagnostic as to where the groundwater is coming from. But again, they do seem to show an elevated delta N15 above what would be expected. I see. So the nitrite basically oxidize the fuel or? Well, one thing I want to clarify, you're, you're saying nitrite and I'm saying nitrate. Uh, no, nitrate, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, because nitrite is not is very unstable. So it uh, would be at very, very low concentrations. But so, okay, so what was your follow-up question now that we've cleared that up? So the nitrate, um, does it oxidize the fuel? Well, it is the, the bacteria that uh, will <clears throat> break down the petroleum contamination will first use, and a different species will use dissolved oxygen, but when that gets depleted, then the next uh, energy, most energy efficient source for respiration would be nitrate. So that will be the next in the series. And then, of course, if nitrate gets depleted, then uh, it goes to, I think, sulfate or ferrous iron. And I may have the two uh, swap there. But yes, it is, in fact, somewhat of oxidizing of the, uh, the fuel, but it's biomediated bio oxidation. Oh, I see. Yeah. So the bacteria is the fuel for food for the bacteria, yeah? The nitrate? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, we have one, I guess, comment and uh, in the chat from Ali El Qadi to Eric Atias and Don of rates of interest is also residual NAPL in the saturated zone above the water table after the onset of a release. That zone would have a mix of water, air, and residual product. In the long run, that product can dissolve and cause future contamination. I don't know if you have comments on that comment. Um, the comment is, is certainly true. Um, the, um, we, we suspect that there is some residual hydrocarbons of a, a number of different types present below the tanks. And work has been done by the Navy contractor to use uh, both, um, you know, they, they, they have, have attempted uh, ground penetrating radar as well as electrical resistivity tomography uh, inside the tunnel in an attempt to try to image the, the pathway 
of the November release uh, on its way down into the infiltration tunnel at Red Hill Shaft. Um, we are uh, still waiting to see the results of those studies. Um, you know, in, in the review of the, of the original proposal, there were, I'll say, mixed opinions on whether that would tell us something or not. And so you know, I, I am waiting to see the results of, of that work before I, I want to consider it as a, as a technique that we might apply. Okay, any sliding in the last question. Are cores from the new wells being analyzed for that? Yes, they are. Um, they, uh, actually, the, the cores are being analyzed as they are collected uh, using a, um, a specialty type of detector. Uh, it's called a photoionization detector that is intended to detect vapors from fuel contamination. And my understanding is that, that as those uh, wells are being drilled, they are testing the recovered core for evidence of contamination. Okay, um, looks like we're just about at the, at the hour. So um, just gonna wrap things up. Uh, Don, Bob, if you had any closing comments that you wanted to make before I um, make closing remarks. Um, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like to thank everyone for their questions and our opportunity to discuss this important topic. Okay, and I I would certainly echo that. And uh, you know, I I I wasn't uh, uh, telling any tales. I welcome input from anyone who who sort of has suggestions on you know how we can accomplish this task better. Um, you know, if if you know of a technique that has worked in other environments. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear about it and under what circumstances. And you know, if we don't have it on the agenda, and it looks like it, it will give us information that that we can't otherwise acquire. You know, we this this we propose this program as a two year program. Um, certainly, in the second year, if there's something that that we've missed. I would have no hesitation about including other techniques uh, in the second year of work to see if, you know, if we can in fact get that data. So again, I appreciate all the input and sort of, I know a lot of folks have a lot of experience in other areas that uh, we haven't been exposed to. So uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs>